Hi, everyone. I'm Keith Vitale, and welcome to Psychic Podcast. In this episode, I'm really excited to have on as a guest today one of my best friends, Keith Strandberg. And before I bring him on, let me tell you a little bit about him. His resume is pretty impressive. He attended Oberlin College in Ohio, where he got a degree in Chinese literature and Chinese language. He writes and speaks Chinese fluently. Now, I should tell you a little bit about his intellect. He's got a master's degree in script, uh, script writing. He's an award-winning writer. He won Best Screenplay at the International Film Festival in New York for a screenplay called Frontier Honor. He's penned over 30 scripts, 10 of which have been made into movies. Movies I'm pretty sure you've heard of. King and a Kickboxer, uh, American Shaolin, Super Fights, and of course, Blood Moon and No Retreat, No Surrender 1, 2, and 3. And I was fortunate enough to be in 3. And another one called Super Fights and Blood Moon as well. Uh, please welcome my good friend, Keith Strandberg. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Good, Keith. Thanks very much for having me on. Big fan of the podcast. And uh, I think what you're doing is really important, getting these stories down for posterity. Well, wonderful. Well, you know, for those who don't know, Keith and I go way back. We have uh, been friends for years. Our families have been friends for years. Uh, we've made movies together. We actually, we'll talk about it today. We, we actually worked together before we did movies together like that. But for the audience right now, why don't you share with everybody where you live now and, uh, and what do you do? Well, before we do that, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that I taught you how to play basketball at a high level. And I also taught you tennis at a high level and football. So just to get that straight before you try to start. And I'm known as Keith number one uh, and you're Keith number two. So oh, That's all true. All true, except for the sports. Well, okay. And of course, except for the Keith number one and Keith number two. Other than that, everything you said was accurate. But go ahead. I remember that one time we were checking into a... Uh, into a, a hotel, you and I, and we, we went up to the desk and we told him that we were Keith Vitale and Keith Strammer and Lady looks at us and goes, are you brothers? <laughs> right. It didn't happen once, that happened twice. And you know what you always, what your next question was? You always go, who's younger? Who's younger? <laughs> <laughs> and they always said me. So just to, just to let you know, I'm living in Switzerland now. I live just outside of Geneva, Switzerland in the French speaking part of Switzerland. And I moved over here about uh, 15 years ago. I work in the watch industry, in the luxury watch industry. I work for a brand called Bobe. I'm wearing their timepiece now, which is a very high-end brand, and I do all the content for Bobe. And I love living in Switzerland. Luckily, you've, you've come over and visited me, and hopefully you'll be coming over again this year to, to hang out a little bit in Switzerland. That's wonderful. Now, Kathy and I, my wife Kathy and I, we visited you and Sophie and the family in Switzerland a few years back and we traveled a little bit and we got a chance to go visit a castle and it was snowing at the time. It was in December. Uh, we went inside, had Swiss chocolate. It was like a fairy tale. It was just something we'll never forget. And then we took the train and went through the Alps and then into Milan, Italy. And we still talk about that. We plan on doing that again later this year and when we visit your family. So uh, just great, best of times. Uh, but let's go back to the beginning. Why did you choose, out of all languages, why did you choose Chinese? Well, it's, a, it's interesting because I started training in the martial arts when I was 14, I guess. And so when I went to college, I decided I was going to uh, study Oriental philosophy. I wanted to study Asian philosophy. And I, and I figured that since I was studying Asian philosophy, I was going to have to read the text in the original language. And since China, uh, Japanese came from Chinese, I decided to, to study Chinese. And I had a bit of a background with languages. In junior high, they made us take a semester of French, German, and Spanish in junior high. And then in high school, I took four years of German. But when I, when I took my first class of Chinese, I realized how simple the grammar was. And compared to the complexity of the grammar in German, I really fell in love with Chinese, and then I made Chinese language and literature my major. I had a second major of physical education, which is the sports angle, with a minor then in Oriental philosophy. You know, that's that's more than impressive. Chinese is we have an expression expression here in our country. 
It's called, <laughs> it's as hard as Chinese because it's so hard. And I'm not being disrespectful to, to their language, but which was harder for you to learn the writing of the characters or to learn how to speak? Well, the writing is probably the most difficult because it's all memorization. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no alphabet. It, you have to learn each character. If you don't know the character, you have no idea what it means. But uh, so, but I really love to write the characters. In fact, I, I still take Chinese class every every week. I took a Chinese class this morning on Skype, and my son takes Chinese classes too because he is falling in love with the language as well. And the the Chinese language really really helped my career because. You know, I was writing for martial arts magazines, and then I was I was taking tours to China. I was the I, I was the tour guide because back then in the early '80s, you couldn't go as an individual to China by yourself. You had to join a tour, and so they hired a bunch of guys like me, guys and girls like me that spoke Chinese, and we were the tour guides. So I was doing tours in mainland China of Americans. I did nine of these tours, and a couple of times I had a week in between each tour in Hong Kong. And I was already writing for some martial arts magazines at the time. So I thought, oh, it'd be interesting to see if I could write screenplays. And so I wanted to contact some of the Hong Kong companies like Golden Harvest and Shaw Brothers. And so I called up these guys and they all just sort of hung up on me. I called them and I didn't speak Cantonese. But I did call Seasonal Film. And I knew that the head of Seasonal Film, he goes by NG, I knew he spoke Mandarin because he came from Shanghai. So when I called him, I started in English, and he was about to hang up with me. And I switched to Chinese, and we got we, we hit it off right away, and he invited me over to his company, and I spent the whole day in his offices talking about movies and talking about how we could maybe pair an American story with Hong Kong action. And it was really funny because he had made a, a Bruce exploitation film. Uh, I think it was called The Legend of Bruce Lee where he mixed footage of Bruce Lee with footage of characters that were pretending to be Bruce Lee. And he showed me a scene of this movie, and he said, you know, see here where I used this footage from Bruce Lee, and I, and I stopped him. I said, NG, I'm sorry, but that's not Bruce Lee. And he went, oh, yeah, it is. I'm the producer. I mean, he got kind of mad. He said, uh, of course it's Bruce Lee. I'm the producer. And I said, I promise you it's not Bruce Lee. So he got the phone, and he called the editor of the film, and he said, hey, Tell me, is this is this uh, scene? Is that Bruce Lee? And the editor goes, No, that's not Bruce Lee. And so I, I raised up in his estimation because of that, because I was I knew I mean I was such a huge Bruce Lee fan. I'd seen every move and I, I know his moves. And I said, you know, I knew that wasn't Bruce Lee. Well, yeah, I people now today have no idea the impact that Bruce Lee made on all of us back then. I mean, he was. He influenced every single one of us that are older than 30 years old or 40 years old. Was at that time was Bruce Lee still alive when you met NG for the first time? No, he had uh, he had died in '73, and I know you're way older than I am. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when I met yeah, so uh, when I went through, met with NG, it was 1983, so it was 10 years after Bruce Lee had died. Oh my goodness. So, but he was already uh, working with Jackie Chan at the time. Oh, he had done Jackie Chan's first two movies, uh, Drunken Master, which was a huge success. Yeah. And he also did Snake in the Eagle Shadow. So he was good friends with uh, with uh, Jackie. And, you know, Jackie was in several of Bruce Lee's movies. Right, right, yeah. I, I did the film with Jackie Chan, as you know, and he would talk That's about right. Bruce Lee a lot. And it was always... So interesting to me that he didn't want to be compared to Bruce Lee at all. And I'd tell him, I'd say, you know, you're such a great actor. Why don't you do more serious films? And Jackie would go, no, no, no. People will compare me to Bruce Lee if I do a serious film. And I always uh -huh. thought that was a little odd. But he says, no, I have to make it, you know, do the comedy aspect of it because I don't want anybody comparing me to Bruce Lee. And I went, well, that's not a bad comparison. But that was his mindset at the time. Well, he was, he was smart, you know, because... Nobody does compare him to Bruce Lee. You know, it's, it's a different style altogether. He's not the, I don't think he actually trained in traditional martial arts. He trained as a, in the Beijing Opera. So unlike Bruce Lee, who had done, you know, he had trained in, uh, with Yip Man, he had, he had trained in, um, boy, I forget, I'm blanking on the name of the Kung Fu that he trained in, Wun Chun. Um, so Bruce Lee was a 
was a classical martial artist that then developed his own style. Right. Whereas uh, Jackie was a was an actor from the start, a performer from the start. Right. No, that's a that's a great point. I and actually I've never made that observation before. But you're right because Samuel Hung and Yong Bao and Jackie all attended that Peking Opera School. They learned how to right. sing and dance and do sword fighting and they could do paint. They could do it all. All oh, by the way, they can also learn martial arts and and it was everything together. And it was a very austere camp they went to for like ten years. And right. and Samuel told me. They even outlawed that type of uh, school after they left because it was just too too, just too rough and too austere. Yeah. Because they the instructors were pretty tough towards their their you know their students at the time. But What's working with because if you look at if you look at your style, like your beautiful sidekick is a classic beautiful sidekick, and you watch a, a Jackie Chan sidekick, it's completely different because it's you know it doesn't finish like yours finishes. It's not as as classically beautiful as your kick, but it, it gets the point across as it is. That's, that's a good point. And my roots and my lineage goes back to people who did train with Bruce Lee. Of course, they didn't right. train with Jackie Chan or that group. So that's why right. my, my psychic looks more like Bruce Lee's than Jackie Chan's. Exactly. And right. uh, no, that's a good point. So really, you were the conduit to get into the United States for films with for the first time ever for NG. So that's the first time ever coming to the United States when he made that first film. And uh, tell me more about the first script you guys that you wrote for NG. Well, after that day we spent together, he said to me before I left, he said, look, if I ever do an American film, because I was really lobbying him to do an American story with American actors, but have, have Hong Kong action in it. And before I left that day, he said, look, if I ever do it, I'll call you and you'll write the screenplay. And he goes, oh, yeah, by the way, you know how to write a screenplay, right? And as a writer, I always felt that if I can learn the format, I can write anything. You know, I've written everything from advertisings to documentaries to feature articles to newspaper stories. So I thought, you know, I can write anything, sure. And so I said to him, yeah, I can write a, a screenplay. So I went back to America and went about with my life. I was actually a tennis pro at a, at a local sports complex and, and doing a lot of other things. And then one day I got a call from him out of the blue. I got a call that said, Keith, I'm ready to make the movie. Let's make it. And so I quit my job. I flew to Hong Kong and I met with, I lived in Hong Kong for a, about two months working with him every day on this story, which became No Retreat, No Surrender. And I wrote the script. And you know, as a screenwriter, that one page of a script equals one minute of screen time. And a normal martial arts movie should be about 85 pages or 85 minutes, something like that. Very short. My first draft of No Retreat No Surrender, which, which I was calling Ring of Truth at the time, came in at 220 pages. So I had written like a Dances with Wolves <laughs> martial arts movie. But it was a great experience for me because I was on set every day of the, of the making of No Retreat No Surrender out in L.A. and Seattle. And so I learned what worked and what didn't work. I learned what I had to cut and what, I, what needed to stay. So it was a great experience for me working on the set. And I was also the translator for Yuen Kuei, uh, Corey Yuen, who was the director of No Retreat, No Surrender and the, the fight choreographer. And then he went on to do a lot of great movies like Lethal Weapon and some others where he was the, the fight choreographer. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm so impressed with him. That guy is just, I think, one of the best of all time. So, no, I was, I'm kind of envious that he had a chance to even work with him. So you filmed that in Los Angeles. Um, right. Tell me about the casting process. How do you choose your cast? Well, we found we used a we used one of those uh, uh, talent agents that helped us find the main cast. So we found Kurt McKinney, who was the lead, and we found some of the other guys through this talent agency that helped us find some really good actors. But we were also looking for a bunch of fighters, and we were looking for the bad guy. So we put out what's called an open call, uh, also called a cat, uh, cattle call, where you just you rent a studio. We rented a studio on, on, in Raleigh Studios in L.A., and we had all these people come, and we had hundreds of people come. I mean, it was just amazing how many people showed up. And we were running out of time, and we were still looking for the bad guy. And so NG said to me, Keith, do me a favor, go outside and walk down the row and pick out as many people as you think might be right for the bad guy. And the thing about the no retreat, no surrender bad guy, he had to be a very good fighter. 
So I was walking on this road and everybody's looking at me like, oh, pick me, pick me. And I saw Van Dam was in line and two other big guys were in line. And so we, I took these three guys and I, I brought them into to be in front of the actor and, uh, uh, sorry, in front of the director, Yen Kui and NG and me. And as soon as, uh, as soon as Van Damme started kicking, we were like, that's the guy. He, his kicks were so beautiful that uh, we chose him right away. That's, that's fate. I mean, you didn't even have a chance to even see him kick before you brought him into the audition. That's pretty cool. Well, speaking honestly, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I mean, they just said, pick some guys that you think would look like a bad guy. So I picked, you know, he's a bit of a small guy. He's smaller than you and I. Uh, and so I picked a couple of other big guys. So we had some big, really muscular guys like Mateus Hughes or something. And then we had Van Damme. And so when Van Damme came in and did his traditional, you know, he picks his knee up real high and kicks up high. I mean, oh, yeah. I've been in, I, I, you know, you've been in casting sessions like that. As soon as you see somebody kick, you go, ah. Right. He knows how to kick, you know. Right. And then when you see somebody who doesn't know how to kick, you know immediately they don't know how to kick. <laughs> it's like being in the martial arts and you're in a karate studio, and somebody's performing a kata, a form. You don't have to wait till the end of the form to determine if that person's any good. You know, in the first few moves, if he has intensity and good technique and focus, etc. Uh -huh. So, wow, that's that's a credit, that's a feather in your cap for, you know, discovering Van Damme that way. That's pretty cool. Um, and he was he was a good guy so to work with. I remember uh, a story was... you told me about one of the actors, or maybe it was just a stunt fighter, that he was upset because he didn't want to lose in the film. You know, <laughs> tell me that story again. I mean, and it happens it happens all the time. It's not just in that first film for you. It happens all the time. Well, it's because we hire real martial artists. You know, one of the reasons why you and I and Mike Di Pasquale started that action fighting school was to train people to fight on the screen. But before that, we were just hiring martial artists. And martial artists, you know, they're, they're good competitors. You know, the, the character that you're talking about was the brother of the love interest for Kurt McKinney. And he was one of the fighters that, that Van Damme was fighting that day. And so we had, you know, we had already set everything up and we go in to film that day and he comes over to me and he says to me, Keith, you know, I, I don't want to lose today. <laughs> And I looked at him and I was like, what are you talking about? You've read the script. You know you lose. He goes, yeah, but I, you know, I got a reputation. He had a school and he was a competitor. He said, I got a reputation. I, I can't lose. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God. What am I going to do? And then I came up with the idea that we make Van Damme cheat. And I think in his fight, he grabs the turnbuckle off the corner post. Right. And wraps it around this guy's head. And that's how he's able to beat him. So he was okay with losing if Van Damme cheated, but if it was straight up, he didn't want to lose. Well, you know, I had a phone call in my career. I had one from the casting agency out of, out of uh, San Francisco. It's for the uh, TV series Nash Bridges with Don okay. Johnson. And uh, so they called me up, and I had already been in one of the episodes, and they wanted to bring me back. And they said, we want you to fight this guy named Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I right. said, oh, great. That'd be great. They said, but we have to give you some bad news. We have to inform you that you lose in this fight. And I, I giggled. I said, is it in the script? And she goes, yeah. I said, well, then I lose. I said, I don't even understand why you'd be telling me that. And she says, oh, you must not be a wrestler. I said, no, I'm not a wrestler. She goes, it, it says, when we cast wrestlers, none of them want to lose on film. And I went, oh, my gosh, the ego of some of these people. But maybe that's their you know, manager, agent, or whatever going, I want you in this film, but you can't lose. And I know Th Cynthia Rothrock, I interviewed her for an earlier podcast, and she told me a story when she was in Hong Kong making movies, and uh, there was one actress that said the same thing. I can't, I cannot die in this movie or be beaten in this movie. And so they filmed it in one way where she wasn't. And as soon as she got on the plane and headed back to America, they reshot the ending, ending again. And killed her. <laughs> But well, no, that's, that's so cool. And so that was your first movie. You shot it there. And uh, were you just the writer at that time or did you produce it at the same time? No, I was just the writer. And I was also the second AD. So I was learning all about filmmaking, too. And I was the translator for Yen Kui because Yen Kui didn't speak any English. So whenever he had to talk to an actor, he'd tell me and then I would talk to the actor. So it was great 
experience for me learning how to deal with the crew and learning how to deal with the with the uh, actors and so that really was great training for me to be a producer uh, I want to tell you another funny story from Norwegian no Surrender. I think you knew Pete Sugarfoot Cunningham right he was the uh, right. middleweight kickboxing champion of the world never been knocked out and he was one of the guys in the in the bad dojo uh, and he was fighting Van Dam. And Van Dam did this fl flying, spinning crescent kick. And you know, Van Dam's fault was that he thought you needed to be really close to somebody to make it look good. And you and I know that the, there can be miles between a punch and somebody's right. face. As long as the reaction is right, it looks great. But he didn't know that and, and didn't want to know that. He didn't want to learn it. So he kept trying to be as close as possible. And in this scene, he does this kick and he actually knocks Pete out. The first time he's ever been knocked out, never been knocked out in his career, oh he, got knocked out, he got knocked out in, in this. And the problem was when Van Dam landed after this kick and he saw that he had knocked out Pete, he went to go help him. And so we couldn't use the take because he landed. He didn't like get into his stance. He landed and he went, oh, Pete, are you okay? So we had to stop it and we had to wake Pete up, Pete up and we had to do it again. And... <laughs> And so we lined it up again, and the act, and the director said action, and Van Dam knocked him out twice. He knocked him out again. Oh my gosh! But this time he stopped and he held for cut, and then we went and helped Pete. <laughs> Get this: people that watch my podcast, they know because I've I've already recorded these podcasts and talked about it. But the same thing happened to me when I did Wheels on Mills with Jackie Chan, and right. I was in a fight scene with him. And over and over, I would kick Jackie Chan with a sidekick. And I was using my left leg, and I had no control. And it was my fault, and I kept on hurting him. And get this, every time I would hurt him, he'd go to the ground, and he'd be in excruciating pain. Samuel Hung would look at me and go, more power, more power. <laughs> Jackie would look up at him like, you're crazy, more power. So anyway, we finally do the scene seven, eight times. I hurt him all seven, eight times. Each time is like a 30 minute break between because I'm really, you know, I'm crushing his chest full speed with the psychic, no pads at all. So you, I cannot, I don't even understand how I didn't crush his chest. My last take, I hit him in the throat. I feel it through my shoe that I crushed his windpipe. I break character, I rush over to him. And when I rushed over to him, you would have thought I stabbed each and everybody on that cast in the eye or the crew in the eye. They all started screaming, what are you doing? Stop, stop. And I went, I'm trying to take care of Jackie Chan. I know I heard him. Samuel Hung got mad. No, no, never stop. That's the out. That's the one we're going to use. The one you heard him is the one we're going to use because I kicked him in the throat. Jackie got mad at me. He goes, I've been taking this this whole time. And, you know, he got mad at me. Raymond Chow, the producer, was there. He got mad at me. I literally thought I was fired on the spot at that time. Right. But instead of that, they created another scene for me to utilize my sidekick in another scene. But it's the same thing. You don't break character until you, you know, until the director says stop. But your, right. I guess, it's yeah. your normal reaction is is to break character, and run over there, and take care of the person you just hit. That's right. And in No Shoot No Surrender, Van Dam was a, was great to work with. He was willing to do anything. He would try things over and over and over again. He was really a pleasure to work with. It was just after that that he broke his contract with us. And uh, I remember watching him on TV, and he'd be asked, what was your first movie? And he never said No Retreat, No Surrender. He always said Blood, uh, Blood Sport, which was the movie right. he made after No Retreat, No Surrender. And I always wanted to, like, jump through the TV and grab him and say, no, say No Retreat, No Surrender. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. Um, he used to uh, come into Canon Films when I first broke into film. He used to come into Canon Films, and he wanted to meet Menachem, the the producer, the owner of Canon. Right. And um, the lady that hired me, that gave me my first break in the films for Revenge of the Ninja, she would have him come in, and he would sit there sometimes for hours and hours waiting to meet Menachem. She told me she's. I liked the way he looked, so I just had him sit in a chair every day, and he didn't care. He just sit there like this. <laughs> so he was That's destined funny. to be a big star. But man, that guy had talent. You know who? You know another one who had talent like that. Going back to this film camp, you know we had the idea. You had the idea actually to start a film camp. We did a Storm King in a mountain in uh, New York, 
and we brought in Michael DiPasquale and we started this camp. To, we brought people in from all over the world to come in to learn how to break into the films. One of the guys that came in was a guy named Scott Atkins. Oh, and, you know, you brought him in. And in one of my earlier interviews, I just remember my first reaction. And, and I had two reactions, two emotions. One was, this is the best athlete I had ever seen in my life. I mean, to me, he was better than Bruce Lee. He had the looks. Remember all the kicks he could do? And then the second emotion I had was I was so depressed because he was the best athlete I'd ever seen. And I went, I could never do it. That kid's do it. Oh, my God. Right. That guy is just fantastic. Do you remember well, him he when he came out? Our, yeah, he came to our camp, and I desperately wanted to use him uh, when we made Blood Moon. I think we really wanted to use him, uh, but he was a U.K. citizen, and we couldn't get his permit to work for SAG. But I definitely, I absolutely wanted to hire him. He was such a nice guy. I still see him, you know, maybe once or twice a year. I see him when I go over to the UK. He's a great, great guy, really a nice guy. And that was, I had those two reactions that you had, plus another reaction, which was, what a nice kid this kid was. I mean, he oh, was humble, good. and he was just, you know, willing to do anything. He was so respectful, and he still is that way. Uh, and he's now getting some really deserved praise. He just made a movie, uh, XM Man 2, which I think was very well received. And he's in John Wick 4, the new one. So he's he's getting the recognition he deserves. I think he's, in my mind, he's probably one of the best on-screen fighters we've ever seen. Right. No, I, I agree. I, I just remember when he came out, we were speechless. We, I just couldn't believe everything he was doing with ease. And he had to yeah. build the looks. And I just went... There must be something in the water in Britain. Because, you know, you have Darren <laughs> Chevalier, you have Gary Daniels. What are they doing right. over there? I mean, yeah, that's you know, right. So I was like going, I've, I've got to start, you know, working out a little bit more. That guy was just so impressive. You know, so let's, I want to talk a little bit about our film camp because our film camp was fantastic. We had two actually themes in the film camp. We had Michael D and Joe Hess and one of the themes we had were people trying to break into films as stunt fighters. Not stunt mm -hmm. fighters, but stunt men. Remember they had all the falls and car crashes and, and Mike Jones would light himself on fire trying to teach people how to do all that stuff. And you right. and I contended that that's the hardest way to break into the films. You've got to be part of a film school or a stunt school you got to learn how to do the high falls. you got to learn how to crash the cars. But the easiest way to break into the films is by being a stunt fighter. And uh, do you have any tips for people? You know, there's a lot of aspiring martial artists out there right now wanting to break into to action films. When I say action films, not martial arts films, because there's martial arts in all films now that have action in them. Tom Cruise, you name it, they're all doing martial arts. So the whole idea is if you want to break into the films, you know, what What would you suggest to people about uh, maybe just a few tips on how to break into films? Sure. Well, I think you can trace the lineage of all that martial arts uh, stuff that's in all the mainstream films now back to the films we made back then, Keith. I mean, Noro Chino started to really start it with having Hong Kong action in an American story. And then your films continued that on. And the more, the more movies we made, the more people saw that you could integrate that kind of fighting into really any movie. And as you said now, you know, Tom Cruise and Matt Damon, they're all, they're all using martial arts kind of style fighting. And, in, and John Wick, too. I mean, all, all these movies use the kind of fighting that we were doing in mainstream pictures. But I think that you're right. Breaking into film, it, the easiest way to break into any kind of film is as a fighter. Because there's only one main good guy and that's usually Keith Vitale uh, but you need a bunch of guys that Keith Vitale, Vitale can beat up and those people need to do reactions well and that's the key is if you make the star look good you'll always work you know if you have these if you have the, the reactions where you can twist your head and you can fall down and you can do all the reactions in, in perfect timing You'll always find work. In fact, I remember, Keith, one of your friends brought, came to a casting call for Blood Moon. I don't know if you remember this, but he brought two of his students along with him. And he was doing a routine for us as, as casting agents. And he was throwing his, his students all over the place. He was punching them and they were doing reactions. And I remember we looked at the director after he was done 
And the director looked at this guy and he says, I don't want you. I want your students because we don't need a, we don't need the lead. We got the lead. We need the guys that will get beat up. And that, that's really the best way to break into any kind of film. I think. I No, I, I agree 100%. I'm going to do a three part series, three episodes on how to break into films. You know, first one is going to deal with perfecting your art. You got to perfect it. Be better than I, you know, I, I, Bill Wallace is limited to one side only. You know, there's so many things I can't do, the somersaults and some of the other stuff. You know, so if you can perfect your craft and be like a Scott Atkins, can do anything, then that's number one. And then two, you've got to be able to learn reactions because like you just said, they've already got the star. You know, they usually shoot on location and they bring their stars with them. And they're looking for local talent because of a lot of reasons. The easier, it's cheaper to hire them there. You don't have to pay for transportation. And then two, most of the time for tax benefits, you've got to hire locally anyway. So that really works out. And then three, my third episode is going to be, you know, on how to, to do your resume and how do you reach out. And it is kind of liquid right now. It's the whole industry is changing as we speak, because before, you know, you go to the set or I mean, you go to a casting call, a cattle call and you need audition. And now after COVID, a lot of that's changing too. Now it's about sending and maybe reels in. Uh, once in a while you get to go on location, but, but you hit the mark right there. And I've asked everybody I've interviewed how to give me some suggestions about how to break into the films because I kind of want everybody's uh, input on that. And I, before, I got this observation just last night. I watched two martial arts movies last night. I watched a whole John you know, Van Damme uh, movie. His his latest one is about uh, a fighter. I'm, I don't know who the fighter was from what country, but it was a really good film. And then I was going through Netflix and Amazon Prime and these stations. And I used to think there was an era of martial arts movies. Then it died. And then you had regular action movies. And now you have martial arts in all those movies. You don't need a per se martial arts movies, but that's not true. There's so many movies still being made that are pure martial arts movies. Look at Scott, uh, Scott Atkins. He, he does probably has 30 of them like that. Ong Bao and Jason. I mean, there's so many actors out there still doing pure martial arts movies, as well as action films that people have the chance to break into. And the key is just like this. All you have to know is this. Make that star look good, and they'll want to use you over and over. And your example of that friend is one of my best friends to this day. <laughs> He's the one who didn't get the role. I, I still am so sad for him because he called it his Yuki, and he would throw that Yuki around and spin him around, and the guy was fantastic. And then I remember at the end they went, we'll take the guy on the ground. I went, oh, no. <laughs> Well, I think what's really important, and one of the reasons why you have done so much work, is that you also had a really good attitude. You know, if somebody asks you to do something, you say, I'll try anything. You know, uh, and, and that's really important, is to have a good attitude about how you're doing it, and uh, and being the best worker you can be. You, you mentioned about that this change that people now submit reels and that sort of thing, and that's absolutely true. But you can, you can get burned by doing that too, because you don't want to oversell yourself. Yeah, you know, I remember when we were doing the casting, the casting calls, Keith, and we'd get these actors that would say they were, oh, um, I was world champion in 1995, you know, and but they couldn't do anything. You know, they just wanted to get the role. And if you remember in Blood Moon, we were desperate for the female lead. And we were looking at cassettes, you know, people were sending in these VCR cassettes. And we chose somebody off of this cassette because it looked really good. And then she got on set and she was horrible. You know, because somebody had helped her with the the right kind of choreography that made her look good. But if you remember in Blood Moon, we had to we had to double her most of the time with a with a Chinese man uh, in her fight scenes because she just couldn't do anything. So many times we couldn't believe it. And I remember us we got in all these tapes and we were choosing the star and we go, well, she looks pretty good. You know, let's use her. And when she got out there and she was a nice lady and we enjoyed working with her, but she was just limited. And that's, I think the secret behind Cynthia Rothrock. She was a martial artist first competed. Right. 
and she was bad to the bone. She had power and flexibility and speed and, you know, and she was one of those that could, that had power on screen. And most of the time, I don't know what it was back then that women had a hard time showing their power. They could throw the kicks, but they weren't powerful enough. Whereas Cynthia Rothrock, she looked dynamic. And because of that, she worked, you know, she did 30 films alone just in Hong Kong before she came here and became a bigger star. So uh, you had a chance to work with her as well. What do you think about her when you started working with her? What was the movie you did with her? Well, it was called Raging Thunder. Uh, it ended up being called No Retreat, No Surrender 2. And that was a movie that I wrote the script for. And then I sort of stepped away from it because the guy that was producing it, I, I, I didn't get along with him. And so he ended up producing it and changing the script quite a lot. And then after that movie came out, I went to NG and I said, look, you know, if you want to work with that guy, that's fine. I'll go work with somebody else. And he said, no, 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 I want you to do it. And so that's when I started producing. So with No Two, No Surrender 3, I became the writer and the producer. And this guy was okay. no longer involved. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you actually produced number two as well. But no, I, I no. knew that and it makes a lot of sense you're the writer and you get to you know you're on the set and then the director says here let's change the dialogue not knowing that if you change the dialogue it right. could have a residual effect by the time at the end of the film you can't know you can't make this guy the hero at the beginning of the movie it's got to be a transformation or whatever the case you know so i can understand why you wanted to become the producer protect you know the integrity of your of your screenplays well, I remember in No Shoot, No Surrender 3, that fight in the garage. Do you remember the fight with you and Lauren in the garage? Uh, I was watching them set up the choreography, and they were having Lauren kill somebody in that fight. And I went right. up to Tony Leung, who was the, the fight choreographer, and I said, Tony, you can't have him kill somebody, because he, he has a line at the end of the scene, if you remember, where he says to you, you killed that guy. And... You know, your your response to him was, "Yeah, that's what that's what this life is like. You got to be ready to do that, or something like that." But his line wouldn't make sense if he'd already killed somebody in the fight before. So I, I told the director that, and he goes, "Oh yeah, you're right. You know, uh, we'll change it." But luckily, I was there on set to watch it, and uh, I could stop it in the middle. But uh, another example where it didn't work as well was in King of the Kickboxers. I had to go to, uh, we were filming in Thailand, and uh, I had to step away from the, the shooting for one day. I had to go to Bangkok, I think, to see another actor or something. So I wasn't on set. And there's a, a, a line where this guy is figuring out that he's in a real snuff movie, in a movie where he's going to get killed. And he gets cut with a knife, and the line, it wasn't supposed to be a knife, it was supposed to be uh, a, a punch to the face, and his line was, Hey, you really hit me. But they changed it to a knife, and the guy still said, after he got cut, he said, Hey, you really hit me. <laughs> I was like, nobody was there to change that line because I wasn't on set at the time. That was the one oh, time yeah. I stepped away, and they made a mistake in the dialogue. Oh, yeah. I, I tell you, you know, I was fortunate enough to do some films with you, and I came to you one day and I said, I want to learn how to be a producer as well. So, you allow me to not only star in, in a film, but also to be the associate producer of Super Fights. And I think one of the things we heard over and over from usually the actors would be, can I change this line? Can I say it this way? Uh, I want to do it this way. And every time you say something like, not no, be God gave me this inspiration to put this on film. <laughs> and you want me to change what God has given me? <laughs> Kind of no, to no, that the, effect. <laughs> no, the way I would answer it, I, I, I would look like I was thinking about it. Like if an actor came up and said, hey, how about we change this line? I go, ooh, that's it. That's it. Let me think about it. And I go, no. <laughs> I remember once we were We're not talking Rick. one time. We're talking maybe oh. dozens and dozens of times. You know, All the and time. When you I, feel, I, going back to the second film, you had great cast in that film. It was a good film. It was a dynamic fighting film. Where did you shoot that movie? That was shot in Thailand as well. That was shot in Thailand. And then we went back to Thailand for King of the Kickboxers. And uh, we was had a, a guy named Richard. Uh, I think at that time it was dangerous. When we were there for King of the Kickboxers, there, there was no danger at all. They were very welcoming right. to, to fight movies. 
But I, I remember in, in King of the Kickboxers, we had uh, Richard Jekyll, who had won an Academy Award for, no, sorry, it was Don Stroud. He won an Academy Award, but he was, he was older and he couldn't remember his lines. And he came up to me and he said, hey, Keith, how about if I just improv this scene? You know, I'll, I'll get all the points right, but I'll, let me just improv because I'm having trouble remembering lines. I said, Don, that's a great idea. But, you know, you're working with a lot of new actors and they won't be able to change their lines based right. on your lines. So I think you should just say the lines the, the way they were written. And he was like, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll do it that way. So I always had a, a way to explain to somebody why they could oh, change the, the lines. Well, that's, that's good. So where do you find your cast for the second one? No Retreat, No Surrender 2. So how did you, how'd you find Cynthia and Matthias and Lauren? Where did you find them at? Well, originally Van Damme was to be the the lead and Kurt McKinney was supposed to be the lead as well. So we had two picture contacts with Kurt, contracts with Kurt and with Van Damme. And then Van Damme decided he didn't want to go to Thailand. I think because he had heard it was a little bit dangerous, so he decided to break his contract with us. And he, I think he talked Kurt McKinney into breaking his contract too, uh, and not going. And I think it all came down to this guy who was the producer. He wasn't, he wasn't a very much of a people person. He, he was trying to force them to do it. And it's never a good idea to try to force an actor to honor their contract because, right. you know, if you force an actor to do something, you're not going to get a great performance. You know, they're going to be unhappy. The movie will probably be not going to be very good. So, you know, we just let that go and re recast. And so we found Lauren in Los Angeles. We found Mateus, who was also living in, in Los Angeles at the time. So we did this, a similar thing. You know, we put a call out for, for martial arts actors, and we found Cynthia, we found Lauren, and we found Mateus Hughes. You know, I never thought about Cynthia for Blood Moon, but why didn't we try to reach out to her for Blood Moon for that part? Because you know, the lady that you mentioned that we got had a hard time. We had to double her most of the time. Well, I think because it wasn't a big enough role for, for Cynthia. You know, Cynthia's a star. And that was, oh, yeah. the, she was the sister of the lead guy, I think, or something. So it was a very oh, small Oh, that's true. Role. I think it was that's too true. small a role for Cynthia. Yeah. I, I tell you, one of the things, I, I've seen the film, one of the things I was impressed was Lauren's technique. You know, personally... I still think he's probably the best kicker, just like, you know, you put him in, up there with Scott and Gary Daniels and those type of people. He just had phenomenal technique, you know, so then that made for a great, you know, fight scene for the end. How long did that last fight scene take the film? Oh, you know, I wasn't, on, I wasn't on set for that. I, I wasn't on there. So I don't, I have no idea how long it took to do it. Uh, you know, I, as I told you, they, they changed the script after I wrote it and they made a lot of changes. And I, and that's when I went to NG and I said, look, I, I can't right. work with this guy, you know? Uh, so I don't know how long it took. I'm sure it took a long time, but you're right. Lauren is, is just a stunning physical specimen when it comes to martial arts. He's doing, his kicks are so beautiful. Yeah. Well, do you know, I was, I didn't know this at the time. I, I interviewed Lauren already. He said that no retreat, no surrender to received a theatrical release. So tell me about that. That must have been pretty nice to, to have your film, you know, hit the theaters. Well, No Retreat, No Surrender had a theatrical release, which was really my first, my first experience with a, with a premiere. And then because of the success of No Retreat, No Surrender, they gave No Retreat, No Surrender 2, which they ended up calling Raging Thunder, a theatrical release as well. So it was a very small theatrical release for Raging Thunder. Uh, the release for No Retreat, No Surrender was nationwide. I mean, never we never got a release like that ever again with any of our movies, unfortunately. But it was such a groundbreaking film, No Retreat, No Surrender, that it got a huge theatrical release. And, and you know, it's still quite popular today on YouTube and all these other places. But Raging Thunder had a release, and I went out to it with my wife. We went out to L.A. to see the premiere. And after I saw the movie, I thought it was a really good movie. But it, you know, the fighting was great, but the story, I thought they had changed the story so much that that's when I went to CNG and I said, look, you know, he made a lot of changes. I think the movie's good, but I'm not working with him. So, you know, let me know what you want to do. And that's when he said, no, 
I'm going to work with you. I'm not going to work with that guy. And then we made, we went on to make eight more movies together. Well, so who was the fight coordinator, the stunt coordinator for two? Uh, I think it was Tony Leung. Uh, oh, good. did some of the fights, uh, but I think Tony Leung was one of the, was the fight coordinator. Listen, I think both of those are two of the best ever as well. Oh, yeah, I, sure. I enjoyed working with Tony. He was such a great guy, such a nice guy, humble. And, uh, you know, part of, uh, we, you know, we talked about how to break into films and had the talent, make sure you're, you're, you know, you had your martial arts skills down pat. And Gary Daniels and Lauren, and there's a lot of actors that hate to be doubled because they want their face on screen time as much as possible. But I know that it didn't hurt my feelings at all sometimes when I would be doubled. You know, Tony Leung actually doubled for me in a couple of, of the, the movies right. that I did. You know, because when it comes time to your reaction, you're fighting the bad guy and the bad guy hits you and you've got to do a triple pirouette in the air and land on the side of a table. I go, next, uh, can you bring the step man in right now? <laughs> my double? <laughs> you know, that's just, it wasn't part of my, my training, you know, and uh, Tony was just, had such a good attitude he, he was so talented and he had his crew together. And I loved how they made their movies and how they pieced together their fight scenes. We did No yeah. Tree, No Surrender 3, remember? Was his little brother called Tin Kid or something? I remember he had one little guy. Yeah, that's right. He had a, yeah. yeah, he had a, a whole team and they'd have videotape over there and they'd be sticking in, you know, action movies and just kind of looking at different techniques and then formulating their own, putting them together. And right. then we would sit and wait, and they'd come over and they'd go, all right, here's your next six, eight, 10 techniques. And we would go through the motion one or two times, and then you go, okay, ready? Okay, let's film. And then you go do it. And then you cut, they go back and you sit there like this and you just watch them, and they put, and you, they were so animated. And they'd be putting their fight sequence together and punch, kick, and whatever, and then they come back out. And the thing that was so hard for me at the time was, they didn't take no, you didn't ever say, no, I can't do that. You're not supposed to. I mean, I would tell people trying to break into the films, every time there's a no to one of their questions, they're going to replace you or the, it's easier right. to replace you. If you can do what you're telling, you know, whether asking, it's going to make life much easier. And of course, having that good attitude. I had the attitude maybe more than the talent. I go, sure, I can learn how to do it. But remember a couple of times, Tony would go, I want you to do a kip up and then jump up and then shoot. And I went, kip who? And he goes, oh, Kip up. <laughs> and I go, can you show me one? And of course, there's stunt guys pop up. And I go, I've never done that before. But remember, I had that cast on my left wrist. Yeah, I broke true. it. I have a gun in the scene on my right. So I can't even use my hands to springboard right. up. So yeah. they gave me five minutes. They took me to the side. They taught me how to do it. They brought me back and they go, okay, let's shoot, let's film. You know, and... I just remember that was I took pride in learning that in five minutes on how to do it, but but the thing about working with them is is that you really have to be sharp. I mean, if you you have to hone your skills because they're going to put together some sophisticated, intricate moves, and you got to be fast, 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 fast. And there's always a beat and a rhythm to their action, which I I love working with Tony. Uh, let me tell you, I I mentioned on another podcast. I didn't have the best time working with uh, uh, who was the director for three uh, Lucas, Lucas Lowe. Lucas Lowe. Lowe. He had that small Napoleon complex, you know, and yeah. in, in his credit, he didn't speak English that well. And you were the interpreter. So it was hard for me to understand him at times. And then, um, and I think it shows in my acting or my lack in acting because the emphasis is not really on my acting with, with, you know, Lucas Lowe, the director. It was get to, you know, say your lines one time, maybe two, and then let's go, let's go fight. Now the fighting would take a week, but the acting, you know, we get our lines in and and sometimes looking back on that, I wish I had I wish I had could say, can I do that like thirteen more times till I get it right? Well I think you you're absolutely right. Lucas was more focused on the look of the film and the fighting than he was on the acting. And I would get into fights with him all the time because he would spend all this time with the extras, all this time with the setup, and then we'd run out of time and we'd have to do the dialogue. I remember one scene, it was at the father's funeral. I don't know if you remember the scene, but he played with the, with the guys with the guns for like hours, getting the guns right with the 21-gun salute. And then he comes to me and says, Keith, you're, 
your scene's three pages long. Cut it to one page. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> we got a story to tell. You can't just, you can't short circuit that. I didn't get along very well with Lucas Lowe. I was very happy when after American Shaolin, we stopped working with him because he was not, right. he was not a nice guy, number one. He didn't really focus on the story and the acting as much. But going back to your point about having good, a good attitude, you know, that the, the fight choreographer is the guy that's trying to make you look the best he can possibly, that you can possibly look. So what he's asking you to do is in your best interest. It's not he's trying to make you do something wrong or, or use the a lake that you don't know or normally use. I remember I was I was translating for Yuan Kui on the set of No Richard, No Surrender, and this he was talking to the he was explaining the fight to this actor who was a good martial artist, and the actor Yuan Kui says first you do a left leg roundhouse kick, and the guy goes oh I'm better with my right, and Yuan Kui looks at me like okay, and he says then you do like a spinning hook kick, and he goes well how about if I do a a jump hook kick instead of a spinning hook kick. And Yuan Kui looks at me and he goes, he says, tell you what, have this guy do the fight scene. And he walked off the set. Just walked off the set and said, and said to the, the actor, you do it. And he walks off and the actor looks at me and goes, what? I said, you're in trouble, buddy. <laughs> Whatever he wants you to do is because he's making you look as good as you, as you can possibly look. Right. So whatever he tells you to do, you just do. And you mentioned your cast in that movie because you broke your wrist. And the reason you broke your wrist is you were willing to do anything these guys asked you to do. They asked you to do a, a technique on a bag, if you remember, that you'd never done before. But you're like, yeah, I can do it. I'll try it. And then you, you did it and you fell and you broke your wrist. And we had to we had to write that into the movie. And it, you know, it's because you had such a great attitude that you got you know, so much work. And because of your talent, uh, you, know, you were the whole package, really, Keith. Well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, I blamed all that on Lauren Avenon because we were at this old karate school <laughs> in, in Florida. It was either Clearwater or Tampa. And yeah. uh, so we're visiting school. We're going to rehearse a little bit. And I think NG and them wanted to see our kicks. And Lauren goes up. I'm telling you, I had never even seen a flying double sidekick to the top of a bag before. So he hits his <laughs> bag and bounces off. What I didn't realize was he had somebody holding the bag. Then my turn was, shoot, I'll try it. And I went, nobody holding the bag. And I remember my first impulse was, man, this looks good. I can't believe I'm doing it. And as soon as both leg feet hit the top of the bag, the bag swayed. And I just right. dropped like a it bag of bricks. And, it, um, and I appreciate you and Lauren both fighting for me to keep me in that role because I could have easily been replaced. But a week later, we were filming the first scene in the bank. And in the bank scene, it justifies me having that cast because you wrote in the script that I get shot in the in the cast. Right. And yeah, then, we made sure that and, I think when you told me that and, story, you're leaving out an important part because, and this is why you can blame it on Lauren, because you guys were done. You you had done the training and you'd done all the kicks and, and you were like getting ready to leave. And then Lauren goes, oh, let me show you one more thing. And then he oh, does yeah. this kick into the bag. And you were like, I, I've never done that before, but I'm sure I can do it. Because they looked at you and they were like, well, can you do that? And it became sort of a back and forth. Now I'm really pissed. Now I'm pissed more than ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, was, it was so, I, I know, but it's fun making the film because it was working with the stunt team there, Tony Leong and his stunt team. They did everything in their power to protect me and make me yeah. look good. And that was why I had such good attitude because every time... I would be doubled or they would do something. I'm going, wow, they're making me look really good. I can't right. do that triples pirouette, but they took care of me. And, and I always appreciated it. And I always showed respect to them because I, I thought they were the greatest people ever. Oh, they, and they were great. They were great workers. Uh, and they, you know, you're right. They were always there for your safety. You know, we used cardboard boxes a lot for the falls, if you remember. And they would always be there holding on to the, to the cargo boxes, and they were the first ones to make sure you were okay. So, yeah, they, yeah. they were really just the greatest guys, honestly. No, I don't know if you remember the story, but uh, working again with Lucas Lowe, we did the airport scene, and we were at the airline's terminal in Tampa. They had just closed down. So we had the whole terminal to ourselves to, to film, which was kind of nice. 
and one of the episodes, or I mean, one of the scenes, I was supposed to, Lauren and I were to race across after the bad guys. And there was a lot of extras there. And a lady and her daughter got in front of me, and I had to stop. So anyway, Lucas yelled at me, started yelling at me for, why'd you stop? Why'd you stop? Anyway, you explained it. I explained it. No big deal. Later that night, I've already told this story. Later that night at the hotel room, there's a knock on my door, and you open the door. And I'm not sure if you were in there already, but there's the director, Lucas Lowe, with a Chinese character. The guy that worked in, on the set, he built sets. He was there with him. And Lucas was at the door, and he was bowing to me over and over going, I am here to apologize. So he comes in, and he's apologizing to me for yelling at me. And the whole time he's apologizing, the other the character, the Asian guy, is behind him yelling at Lucas. Now, I was kind of blown away because here's a guy working for Lucas yelling at Lucas. You know, Lucas is the director. Here's a guy who just works as a crew member, but he's yelling at him. And then Lucas bows about, he bowed like 82 times. Then he walked out of the room. And then I said, Keith, what's going on? And then you explained to me, this guy was some kind of triad member or something, some member in Hong Kong that had some kind of power. And he convinced Lucas to be, you know, respectful to me. And I never forgot that. I remember the guy going, yeah. I want to invite you to Hong Kong and I'll take care of you. And I, <laughs> it's one of my big regrets, never ever going to Hong Kong and let this guy take me out. But it was just, that was kind of a cool story. Do you remember that yeah, happening that was, at all? I do. I do remember that. And, and you know, there were a lot of runners. Lucas was not a very nice guy. And so he he was often rude to people. And, and, and I'm glad he got told off for you because it was out of the out of line for him to be yelling at you like that. Well, what happened to the distribution for No Retreat, No Surrender 3? One and two got pretty good distribution. Do you know any of the background, why it didn't get distributed? As much, well, that, they got distributed, but not as much. Well, it went straight to video because there was a, like the golden age was when No Retreat, No Surrender first came out, when it was, it was sort of on its own. And then a lot of people got into the business, you know, Don Wilson started making his movies. And so the, the movie industry was changing quite a bit. So it was, it was impossible to get a theatrical release in the U.S. for No Retreat, No Surrender 3. We did get a theatrical release in other countries, which was very interesting. You know, we, we were in theaters outside of the U.S., but trying to get a theatrical release in the U.S. Didn't, wasn't happening back then, and then it just continued to get worse. I, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, a lot of the movies were going straight to video, and then people were making movies. Right. You know, we needed a certain amount of time to make a quality action movie. I remember having a discussion with, uh, with Don Wilson at one of these camps that we went to. And I, you know, I asked him how many days, because you know, our minimum time that we could make a movie in was 36 days. And, you know, at, at, you remember Super Fights, you know, you did a take 56 times. Do you remember this? You were kicking somebody and you had to redo it and redo it and redo it. And I think you ended up doing it 56 times to get it perfect. And I had a, a discussion with Don Wilson. He said he made some movies that were nine days. He made a full action movie in nine or ten days. And they had a take count. So they were only allowed to have two or three takes, and then they had to move on no matter what happened. Right. And that's just not the way we made movies. We made movies where, you know, you kept going until you got it perfectly. No, that's a good point. Our, our ending fight scene would take a week to shoot by itself. And we're right. talking early yeah. in the morning to late at night. And yeah. it's, it's the physically the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I fall full contact, and I fall point karate around the world. And that's a piece of cake, you know, because when you're in the ring, even fighting full contact, the guy's trying to knock you out, but you can stall. You can move around. You can circle. I can hit him with a sidekick. When you actually do a film and you're making, you know, you're, you're in the middle of a fight scene, it doesn't matter how many takes you, they require. You've got to give 100% on every take. So if you do it 50 times or 56 times, Every time is as hard as you can at full intensity, and it, it takes you out. Now, imagine that times 8, 10, 12 hours a day times oh. six days. Yeah, that's right. I remember we were making super fights, and uh, one of the actors, I won't mention his name, but one of the actors, he kept insisting that the kick he was, he was throwing was perfect. And the director and you, because you were a co-producer on that, and me, we would say, look, no, it's not right. you got to keep doing it. He goes, it's perfect. And we'd show him the video playback. you say, look, it's too high. He goes, no, no.
No, it's perfect. Right. It was no, just yeah. so hard to, to get it through to him. No, when I, I, I spoke with Don, I interviewed Don Wilson as well earlier, and he said that uh, he had full control over his films. He did like 10 or 12, I think 12 Roger Corman films. And okay. he had total control. He said, one time, Keith, I even fired the director. He said, but <laughs> I had, I would get into the edited room and I edited, I was with the editor for all my films. So he had that kind of control. I mean, did you ever go in the editing room for any of the films you made, or was that out of your hands? No, no, I did go into the editing room. I, you know, I was I didn't have really any decision making during that time. They would ask me what I thought, but quite frankly, I really hate the editing process because I've written the script, I've made the movie, I've been on the set for the whole thing. I don't want to see it again. I I, I just want to see the finished movie. Uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to look at this take, whether this take's better than that take or whatever. I said, you know, I leave that to the professionals. I, I wish I could even read you. I wish I had it ready. The fact, the movie I did with Lauren. You know, of course, I've worked with Jackie Chan. The movie I did, Revenge of the Ninja, got a theatrical release. It was one of the top grosser movies of all time. It was in every theater in the United States around the world. But yet, when people remember me. They seem, seem to remember my scenes with Lauren Avedon, the last fight scene for that movie, uh -huh. No Retreat, No Surrender 3. And I'm telling you, I don't think you have any clue how big of a star Lauren is around the world and how many comments we have received for this film and for this, you know, for just our action, our action scenes. But we had a contest. We did a, a poster signing for No Retreat, Surrender 3. And the best comment, we would sign the poster, send it off. Well, this lady out of Romania gave us the best comment. And the comment was mind-boggling, how we not only changed lives, but we should be given some kind of honor certificate from a university for instilling integrity and honor and showing people right from wrong. I mean, all the stuff she wrote. Of course, she won the wow. best comment, and I've already sent her the poster. So. But the impact that film had on people's lives, you're the writer. So you, as a writer and Keith and Lauren and I as actors in the film, I just I had no clue that we impacted that many people's lives. And the comments are like how we were the impetus to get them to start martial arts. We changed their life when they were suicidal or depressed. That's, you know, like, oh, my gosh, that movie. So. Sometimes all the movies you did get glossed over, but that that end and fight scene for No Retreat, Surrender 3, people can bash me for my acting, but they go, oh, no, but your fight scene at the end was the best we've ever seen. So if well, you had a, I, if you had a get, look back on all your films, we're going to talk about more of them. But just right now, it's like picking your favorite child. You know, let's go with Kaylin, Jake, or, or whatever. <laughs> let's go with, you know, uh, or is it, tell me your favorite your favorite movie of all the movies you've done? Wow, that's that's an interesting question because, it, like you said, it's like picking your favorite child. I think I'm really proud of the impact these movies have made. You know, you mentioned No Retreat, No Surrender 3. I get a lot of comments about the original No Retreat, No Surrender. You know, people will come up to me or I'll get, I, about once a week I get an email or a text that says, you know, you changed my life with that movie. Thank you for doing it. You know, it's, it's the greatest movie I've ever seen. And then I write it back and I say, you should see more movies. Uh, <laughs> you know, because it, but I, it's really hard for me to even watch them. I, I did the commentary for the Blu-ray release of No Retreat, No Surrender. And I, I was like, oh, man, this is, this is, uh, this is Gaston no. Holmes, this movie. I hear all the time, people comment all the time, when will the No Retreat, Surrender 3 be made into a Blu-ray? You know how they're doing those uh, now, remakes? Have you guys yeah, I, uh, you ever talking to NG about that? Well, I'm actually working with NG now to get some of these titles re-released, and No Retreat, No Surrender 3 is one of them. So we're working on getting some more distribution for that. But uh, I think you know, I'm really proud of the impact that we all had on people in the martial arts. A lot of people tell me how they got into the martial arts because of the movies that I made. And I think the martial arts is the most wonderful thing, you know, that gives people confidence gives them discipline, gives them a sense of honor. And I think that you know, before my career is over, I'd like to make another movie that, that sort of goes back to those original kind of naive roots of 
trying to make a movie that will impact people's lives like that. Because right now, the movies that are out there, these superhero movies and things like that, there's no redeeming value to these movies. Right. There's no right. honor. There's no there's no sense of changing anyone's lives with these movies. They're just popcorn pictures that you forget about after you're done watching them. Well, Keith, I want to thank you for being on the show today. I really enjoyed it. You know, we're best friends. People don't know this, but we FaceTime each other. You're in Switzerland and I'm here in Georgia. So maybe once every couple of weeks we communicate and I've loved keeping in touch with you. So thank you for being on the show. And if you like this episode, please, I want you to like it. I want you to share it with some friends. And of course, leave comments and hit that button where it says subscribe. Until next time, ciao.